Hi guys, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alan Haynes, who's going to be giving a lecture for us tonight. Um, so I don't want to take too much time, I'm just like, I'm just ready. Okay, ready. thank you. Alright, um, let's see. What I want to talk about are some representative problems of the basic theme question, which objects can we construct if we have a certain collection of tools? And this is something that people have thought about for a long, long time. It's a, it's a very practical problem. I mean, you might, for example, wonder if you're trying to draft, if you're trying to um, draft some sort of architectural designs, what sort of constrictions could you make? Um, what sorts of what sorts of lengths, what sorts of angles, what sorts of shapes could you draw if you were just confined to a certain collection of tools? But actually, I'm not going to really dwell so much on the practical side of it. I'm just going to look at this problem from the point of view that it's a fun and interesting question that ends up involving some sort of deeper mathematics that you might not at first expect. So the, the three representative problems that I'm going to talk about are the three problems in the title, which are problems of constructability, solvability, and origami. And I will explain as I go along what we're doing. So first of all, I want to talk about constructability. And when I say constructability, I mean constructability using straight edge and compass. So there are some very specific rules that I have in mind, which I will tell you. Um, first of all, let me tell you what a straight edge and compass is. A straight edge is just a, it's an unmarked ruler. It's just something that allows you to draw a straight line connecting two points. <coughs> you, you, you don't assume that it has any sort of thickness. It only has one edge. As soon as you lift it off the paper, it disappears. It's just something that lets you, lets you draw a line through two points. And by a compass, I don't mean the kind of compass that you use to find your way, like with maps and like orienteering. I don't mean that kind of compass. A compass for... Me is a tool which lets you draw a circle with one point at the circle and with one point at the center and another point on the circumference. You, um, you probably have seen these. I don't know if they still use them in school, but at least when I was in school, we used to use compass. Um, and the basic question is, if, if you just start with two points in the plane, what lengths, angles, and shapes can you construct? Now, this is a question that's been around for a long time. I don't know the exact history of it, but I know that at least from the 400s BC, the Greeks were studying this question. And in Euclid's Elements, which is 300 BC, he gives a pretty extensive description of it. So let, let me be specific about the collection of rules that I want to enforce. Um, if you're in my Gawa 3 class, this is a good review. <laughs> so. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm talking about constructions that place, take place in two dimensions, so on like an infinite sheet of paper or on the plane. And I'm going to identify the plane with the complex numbers. That's just for convenience. You don't necessarily have to do that. Now, the rules are you get to start with two points, which are the points 0 and 1 on the real axis. And you're allowed to do three possible moves. Move number one is you're allowed to draw a line through two points which you've already constructed. So at the very beginning, there's only one possible line. And rule number two is you're allowed to draw a circle with the center being one point that you've already constructed and a point on the circumference being another point that you've already constructed. Um, rule number three, how do you get new constructed points? Well, you get new constructed points when two circles or two lines, or let's say two non-parallel lines, or a line and a circle intersect each other. And anytime you have two intersection, any, anytime you have an intersection point like that, you're allowed to take the collection of intersection points and throw it into your collection of constructible numbers. So it's also important in the in the rules here that you're not allowed to use an infinite sequence of of um, operations. Every constructible number is a number that you can realize by a finite sequence of th these three operations. And uh, the collection of all constructible numbers I'm going to denote it by script C. That's going to be a notation that's going to stick around for a bit here. So, and I might also talk about constructible angles or constructible shapes. And you can just sort of imagine what that might be. An angle is when two lines intersect each other. Okay? Let's see examples here. So just, to, just to get started with, just to make sure that everybody understands the rules, let's talk about how to construct an equilateral triangle. If you take a point 0 and 1, and you draw the circle centered at 0, and passing through 1, you get the circle on the left-hand side. If you draw the circle centered at 1 and passing through 0, you get the circle on the right-hand side. And now if you take the intersection points of the, the, one of the intersection points of the two circles, whichever one you want, and then you construct all three points, you get an equilateral triangle, right? Because each one of the, each one of the sides of the triangle is a, is a radius of a circle of radius 1. It's pretty easy. 
Now, if you just take that equilateral triangle and you, you so the, the fact that you can construct an equilateral triangle means that you can construct an angle of 60 degrees. And if you just repeat the construction using, for example, the, the top line segment here, and you keep going around the circle, then you get a regular hexagon. Pretty easy. No, this is mind blowing yet. You can also construct the perpendicular bisector of a line segment. So the way that you do this is you take your, you take your line segment and you form two circles. The circle on the left is the circle with this point as the center and this point along the circumference. And the circle on the right is the, the other circle. The circle with the other point as the center and the other point as the circumference. And these, cir these two circles intersect in two points, the two points that I've marked right here. And now if you draw the straight line connecting these two points, that straight line bisects this line segment. And in fact, it's the perpendicular bisector. Now, this, it's, not com it's intuitively um, obvious, but it does take a little bit of a chasing around triangles and stuff to prove that. But I'm sure that you could do it. So once, you construct the, once you can construct the perpendicular bisector of a, of a line segment, you can use that to construct the angle bisector of an angle. And angle, I just mean when two non-parallel lines cross each other. So the, the way that you do that is where you just pick the intersection point of your two lines. By the way, maybe I should make maybe I should mention something here. Um, things in black usually in, in these pictures are denoting objects that exist at the beginning of your construction. So in this example, I'm assuming that I'm starting with some given angle, the angle made by these two black lines. And things things in red are things that are taking place during the construction, and the blue is supposed to indicate the final product. So how does this construction work? Well, you just take the point, which is the intersection of the two lines. You take another point in the space, which always exists. And you, you, you form the circle with the center at the intersection point of the lines and the other point being anywhere you want. And that circle intersects both of the lines forming the angle at equal distances. If you now construct a line segment going from, going between the two intersection points and you form the perpendicular bisector, then it's pretty easy to see from the picture that that's also the angle bisector of this angle. Okay. You can also construct the regular pentagon. You can also construct some other shapes that are pretty easy, like the regular octagon. You can also construct the regular pentagon. And I just want to explain this construction um, just so you can get a feeling for how it can get complicated somewhat quickly. So to construct the regular pentagon, by the way, this is one of the problems on the previous assignment sheet in Galois theory. <laughs> <laughs> to construct the regular pentagon, what we're starting with is um, the points 0 and 1. Oh, actually, so 0 is here and 1 is on the right-hand side of the circle. <coughs> so what you do is you take the line passing through 0 and 1, and it, that's your x-axis, if you like, your real axis. And you take the perpendicular line passing through zero, that's the imaginary axis. Now you, that's the perpendicular bisector of the line segment from minus one to one, so you can do that. And then you take the midpoint of the line segment connecting zero to i, that's this point right here. And then you take the line passing, oh, whoops, passing through that midpoint and the point one. And then you take the angle bisector, that's this green, there's a lot of lines on this one, so I put this one in green, also for orientation purposes. That's this green line. You take the angle bisector of this angle, and now you, you sit down. And this doesn't, by the way, this doesn't happen in two minutes. You, you have to sit, you, what, what really happens is you sit down for three hours thinking about it, and then you finally get the answer. <laughs> you, you take a look at this triangle right here. I blew it up on the right-hand side. What can you say about it? Well, this distance is a half. This distance, if we call it x, then if, if, I drop a per, if I drop a perpendicular to the other side of the triangle here, this distance is also x, because these are congruent triangles. Okay? This is the angle bisector. These angles are equal. These angles are equal, and this side is equal. So if I call this other distance here y, then I, I have two equations relating x and y. And by the way, the, the distance from the point a half i to 1, you can also compute that by the Pythagorean theorem. Okay? And if you take away half, you get that this little line segment here is root 5 minus 1 over 2. Now, you have these two equations relating x and y. This is all just algebra and geometry. And if you solve for y in the first one and plug it into the second one, you get that x is equal to, I'm cheating a little bit here, you get that 
x is equal to, I think, if I get this wrong, maybe something will tell me. I think it's negative 1 plus the square root of 5 over 4. Okay? And it, it turns out that that is actually the real part of the, the primitive fifth root of unity, e to the 2 pi over 5. That takes a little bit of a proof as well. This, this number, e to the 2 pi over 5, it satisfies a degree <coughs> 4 polynomial, irreducible polynomial over 2. But if you take the real part of it, then the real part satisfies a degree 2 irreducible polynomial, and you compute it, it's equal to this. So if this is the real part of a fifth rate of unity, then if I take the perpendicular passing through that point, the perpendicular to the real axis passing through that point, it intersects a circle exactly at the fifth rate of unity, e to the 2 pi over 5. So that, that means that this angle right here is equal to 2 pi over 5, which is exactly the central angle of a regular pentagon. So you continue the construction around and you get a regular pentagon. That was pretty easy, right? You can see why it gets hard fast. So, you know, the Greeks figured out all this stuff. They figured out a lot more than this, actually. But there's uh, several problems that they really wanted to know, that they suspected, I think, that they suspected were impossible. Um, and those problems, these are sort of famous problems. The first one is, is it possible to trisect an arbitrary angle? That means take an angle and divide it exactly into three equal angles. The second problem is usually phrased this way, is it possible to double the cube? What that means is that if I give you a cube of an arbitrary volume, is it possible to construct a cube that's exactly twice that volume? Well, a cube is a three-dimensional object, and so we're talking about two-dimensional constructions. What, what that really means is, is it possible to construct, for example, the cube root of two, the side length of a length of, the side length of a cube of volume two, okay? So double the cube, is it possible to construct the cube root of two? Is it possible to square the circle? That, that, is, that is asking, is it possible to find a square whose area is equal to the area of a circle with radius one? And that's the same as asking, is it possible to construct a number square root of pi using straight edge and compass? And then there, they also had a question I just put here as representative examples of this. Um, is it possible to construct a regular septagon, heptagon, whatever you want to call it, or nonagon? It's a regular seven-sided polygon, convex polygon, or, oh yeah, well, okay. It's a regular seven-sided polygon or a regular nine-sided polygon. In fact, they also wanted to know which collections of regular polygons could you construct. Okay, now, the really cool thing is, the Greeks, they couldn't figure these out, so they actually found ways around it. They figured out stuff like, if you use a ruler, you can do some of them. If you use a ruler instead of a straight edge. But they still couldn't figure out whether or not it was actually impossible. They couldn't prove that it was impossible to do these things using straight edge and compass. And the, the amazing thing is it took a long time to prove that it was impossible. And in fact, it wasn't even proved until the 1800s. So it, it was proved, first of all, this... Uh, Wansell, I think it was, I think it was Pierre Wansell. He proved that the all of these are impossible except for squaring the circle. He couldn't do, and that came, that came, um, that was a corollary of a theorem of Lindemann in 1882. I'll tell you about it later. Okay. And it, Wansell's proof it, it rests, um, it uses very crucially something called field theory, which was developed largely by somebody named. Everest Scalois. Okay. You might have heard about him a few weeks ago here. Okay. Now, next problem that I want to talk about, next representative problem from this collection of problems is the question of whether or not you can solve polynomial equations by radicals. So do you, does this formula look familiar? I hope so. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'll tell you what it is in a minute. So first of all, let me say what the problem is. This one is actually really easier to state. It's more familiar territory to most of us. So if I have a polynomial, um, a n x of the n plus a n minus 1 x of the n minus 1, let's just say it's a polynomial with rational coefficients. I actually didn't, don't have to make that assumption, but let me, just, let me just assume I'm talking about a polynomial with rational coefficients. That means all these ai's are rational numbers, fractions. Um, the question here is, about the roots of the polynomial. And the, the roots of a polynomial, in case you've forgotten this, is the solution to the equation f of x equals 0. It's the solution, and they, they, they're, they're allowed to be complex numbers. Although I'm going to make a comment about that in a minute. So the question here is, is there a formula for the roots of an arbitrary polynomial? 
which involves only its coefficients and a finite sequence of operations from this list. So you're allowed to add, subtract, multiply, divide. You're also allowed to take mth roots, where m is any integer. Um, one, two, three, four, any positive integer. Okay. If it is possible to express the roots of a polynomial in terms of its coefficients and these five operations, a finite sequence of these operations, then yeah. we say that the polynomial is solvable by radicals. And we also say that that root is expressible by radicals. Let me close the door here. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that you will be familiar with these formulas. So if I'm talking about a linear polynomial, that means a, a degree one polynomial, a1x plus a0, and a1 is not zero. I'm not going to talk about constant polynomials, I'll let you figure that out on your own. <laughs> <laughs> For polynomials like this, there's exactly one root, and it's the number minus a0 over a1. That was easy. Okay, warm up. Warm up number two. If I have a quadratic polynomial, a2x squared plus a1x plus a0, and a2 is not zero, well then the roots are given by this equation, the quadratic equation, negative a1 plus or minus the square root of a1 squared minus 4a2, a0 over 2a2. Okay? Better known as something with a, b's, and c's in it. <laughs> so, the thing is that these formulas are around for a long time. And, even I, and they're also very practical. You want to know how to solve the quadratic equation in real life. If, if you look, apparently, I don't read, um, I don't read ancient languages and stuff, but apparently on, on um, ancient Babylonian tablets, they even have formulas or prescriptions that, that the scribes wrote down so that people could solve quadratic equations. So these equations have been known for a long, long time. Now the, the question is, what about, what about higher degree polynomials? Now this is actually a very, very interesting story, and I want to pause here for just a minute and try to tell part of it. So the, the, the picture that you saw in the beginning of this section was actually part of the cubic equation. And that's the reason why they don't make you memorize it in school. <laughs> It's not too pleasant to the eye. I even was debating about whether or not I should put it on the slide, but I sat down there and did it. So if you have a cubic equation, a degree three polynomial and the a degree is not zero, there's a formula for the roots of your polynomial, which is basically the same as the quadratic equation. Remember the quadratic equation had a plus or minus in it, there's two possibilities. The cubic equation has three possibilities. I've just demonstrated one of them here. Okay? And this is actually very interesting. People were searching for the solution to the cubic equation for a long time. And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why they couldn't figure out how to solve the cubic. Um, let me tell you a little bit of a story. So there, there was somebody named Del Fioro at the beginning of the 1500s. And he figured out, let me get a piece of chalk here. <coughs> He figured out how to solve all cubic equations of the form x cubed plus mx plus n, okay? Where m and n, let's just say, are integers, okay? Now, I'm actually cheating a little bit. I'm going to tell you why in a second here. He, he did figure out how to solve all cubic equations of this form. And he told his student, um, his, his student's name was Fiore. And this is in the early 1500s in Italy. People were crazy about trying to solve the cubic equation. And there was somebody else named Tartaglia. And he also figured out how to solve the cubic equation. And so he challenged Fiore to a contest. This is fantastic, and I think they should do it now as well. <laughs> and in this contest, they both have to put up some money. Each person gives the other person a list of problems, and then they go away and see who can solve the most problems. And so it turns out that Fiore gave... Tartaglia, problems of this form. I guess presumably because he knew how to solve them. Maybe there was some rule that you actually had to be able to solve them yourself. And Tartaglia gave Fiore problems of this form. And it turns out that Fiore couldn't solve problems of this form and he lost. <laughs> so Tartaglia became kind of famous during that time. But then what happened, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bad story, this happens a lot in that, is that there was a guy named Cardano. Cardano might have been you know, I don't want to speculate. Maybe he was kind of a businessman or something. I don't know. But Cardano, he came and he asked Tartaglia to tell him the secrets of the cubic equation. And Tartaglia, he, he, he said, I'll do it, but only on the condition that you don't publish it before I get to publish my own work. And so he, he, uh, Cardano agreed. And Tartaglia told him how to solve the cubic equation. Well, the thing is that 
Um, a few years later, I think about five or six later, five or six years later, Cardano found out that De Fioro had already figured out how to solve the cubic equation. So he thought, well, I'm not really publishing Tartaglia's work, I'm publishing Del, Del Fioro's. So he published it. And now it's called Cardano's Formula. <laughs> <laughs> and what's even worse is the quartic, the, the fourth degree equation, it's actually pretty easy to solve once you know how to solve the cubic equation. You can reduce it to the solution of the cubic equation. And um, I say pretty easy. It's not, a, it's not actually really that easy. There is, a, there is some thought that has to go into it. But it, it was actually Cardano's student, Ferrari, who figured out how to solve the, the quartic equation, and it's called Ferrari's equation. Now, they, I'll tell you, the, I'll tell you the, a sort of reprise to the story, which is very interesting, which is, if you look at um, equations of this form, you can reduce the solution to any cubic. I gotta, I'm going to have to hurry this up, but this is too interesting. You can reduce the solution of any cubic to an equation of this form. And so actually, De Fioro had the answer. But you see, the, the really strange thing is that you can reduce any cubic equation to an equation of this form, but sometimes the, these things involve negative numbers. And actually, De Fioro didn't really know about negative numbers. People back then weren't comfortable with the idea of negative numbers. When they got a solution that involved negative numbers, they, they called it an absurd solution. <laughs> and so he actually didn't realize that he had the solution already. Now, I'll tell you something else that's actually pretty cool about this is that even though this is kind of giving you the idea why, why it was so hard for people to solve the cubic equation. I don't even know about negative numbers. Even Cardano writes on the, well, Cardano, yeah, Cardano does write it down. Tartaglia writes on the solution to the cubic equation. But later on, when people came to actually use the cubic equation, they got stuck. Because even for some sort of basic polynomials, I think I got one here, x cubed minus 15x minus 4, okay? So even for some basic polynomials, so this is the case when you can figure out what the coefficients are. a3 is 1, a2 is 0, a1 negative 15, a0 negative 4. So the, this, this, this cubic equation, you can solve it directly because, number one, it has an integer root. Once you've got an integer, you just factor it out, and then you solve the quadratic. And so you get that the solution is equal to is, is equal to um, 4, or 2 plus or minus the square root of 3. Pretty easy to do directly. But the, later on, when people came and looked at this, and in particular a guy named Bombelli, he realized that for certain cubic equations like this one, when you try to use Cardano's formula, on the inside, you end up having to take the square root of a negative number. Now, first of all, they don't even know about negative numbers, so I'm going to take the square root one. That's even, that's even worse. <laughs> but what happens is that you get an imaginary solution, but then it recombines to cancel out the imaginary part, and you end up with a real solution. Now, that, that observation, studying this equation very carefully to try to understand how it works, that's actually what led to the invention of complex numbers. He was basically one of the founders of complex numbers. So there's a really, really interesting um, history here. Um, cool. I think that's enough on this slide. That's it. <laughs> so let, let's, let's talk about fifth degree polynomials now. Now that, remember, that was in the 1500s, which I told you on the last slide. For a long time, people couldn't figure out about the fifth degree. And um, I think I might have suspected that it was impossible to have a general formula involving the five operations that I told you for fifth degree polynomials. Well, okay, for some fifth degree polynomials, like x to the fifth minus two, yeah, you can do it, right? This is general formula. Hope you recognize that. And then, even for higher degree, like this one I wrote down here, look, if you plug, if you substitute in y equals x cubed, this becomes a cubic, and then you can solve for y, and then you can take the, all three cube roots of each solution, and you get the collection of all roots. So for some polynomials, you can express the roots in terms of plus, minus, times, divides, and nth roots. You can express them in terms of radicals. And also, just to be clear about this, all polynomials have roots. In fact, they have the right number of roots if you count them with multiplicity. That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. So we're not saying that polynomials don't have roots here. But what we're saying is that the roots can't be expressed in a particular form. So that, that was actually a theorem of Abel. It's called the abel ruffini theorem. Ruffini gave kind of a, a proof that had a mistake in it at the end of the 1700s. And Abel fixed it. And that was at the beginning of the 1800s. And this, this also inspired somebody named Galois to try to go and understand what actually made this work. What was the, what was the real reason... Um, if there was one, why some of these polynomials couldn't have roots, were not expressible by radicals. Okay. 
So it turns out that this, again, has a negative solution. Just like the constructability problem, there's like certain problems people wanted to solve for a long time. It turns out it's impossible. Here's another example. There's these problems people want to solve, and it turns out that, well, there's a proof that they're impossible. Okay? So section number three, this is not a third problem. What I want to try to explain now, I'm going to get to the third problem in a, in a few minutes here. It's about origami. But what I want to try to explain before I get to that, it, this is going to be a crash course. I'm not going to tell you everything. I want to try to give you the reason why those constructability problems and solvability problems are impossible. I want to try to explain the mathematical reason why they're impossible. So let's go back to the constructible numbers, the ones that you can construct using straight edge encompass. Now, the, 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 we want to try to look at the collection of all constructible numbers, and we, we want to notice these are not these these statements here are not obvious, but you can prove them by using some simple geometry. If you have a constructible number z and it's not zero, then its negative is also constructible. That's actually pretty easy to show. Just take the circle with that zero and that point on the circumference, draw the line, see where it intersects on the other side. And uh, the the inverse is also is also a constructible number. That's a little, that takes a little bit more more work, but you can do it using some triangles. And Okay, so um, the negatives and the inverses of non-zero elements are also constructible. And also, if you have two constructible numbers, and let's just assume that, that I don't know why I put that z is not zero here. Oh, I do know why I put that, but you don't need that right here. Then their sum and their product are also constructible. Okay. <coughs> so if you have these properties together, and together with the fact that these are a subset of c, it implies that the collection of constructible numbers is a field. And I'm not going to have a lot of time to go into many details, but just to give you a feeling for what this is, a field is just an algebraic object. If you've heard of groups and things like that, groups, rings, and fields, isn't that the title of one of the courses? A field is an algebraic object where you can do multiplication and addition in a way that's analogous to the way that you do it in the rational numbers. So you can take inverses of elements, multiply things, add things, you have the distributive law, associative law, all that other stuff. Okay? And then here's some fields that I think that probably many of you have encountered before. You've got the rationals, reals, complex numbers, which are all very familiar. Addition, multiplication, inverses, and non-zero elements. And you've got the, the uh, field z mod pz, when p is a prime number. Integers modulo a prime number. That's actually a field. And here, here at the bottom are some objects which are not fields. Well, the integers themselves are not a field. It is true that you can do addition and multiplication, but you can't take the inverses of elements and stay inside of the integers. If you try to take the inverse of 2, you get a half. It's a rational number. It's not an integer. Okay? Um, similarly, z mod n, z, if n is a composite, it has the same problem. You can't, there are certain numbers that you can't take the inverse of. For example, you can't find a number that when you multiply it by 2, gives you something with the remainder of 1 mod 6. Right? There's no, there's no number that you can multiply 2 to get 1 mod 6. In fact, z mod n, z is actually worse than z in a lot of ways because... Well, it's not actually that bad, but it's worse than z because z at least sits inside of a field, but z mod n z doesn't. Okay. Okay, and here's some more examples of fields. And these 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 ones, I'm. Let me tell you what my notation is here. If I put q and then I have parentheses and then I have some complex numbers inside here, I mean the smallest subfield of the complex numbers, which contains all of the rationals and the numbers in my parentheses. Okay. So the smallest subfield of the complex numbers, which contains all the rationals and the square root of 2, it's the collection of all numbers that you get by taking a0 plus a1 times the square root of 2, where a0 and a1 are rational numbers. Now, this is not obvious, but it's not hard to prove. And similarly, the collection of numbers that you, the field that you get by looking at the smallest field containing q and square root of 2 and square root of 3, it can be written as all linear combinations of square root of 2, square root of 3, and square root of 6, and 1, with coefficients in the rationals. Okay? Also not. If you want to see the proofs of these, you should take groups from the fields or Galois theory, and then you can see the rigorous groups. Um, the smallest field containing q and the cube root of 2 is the collection of all linear combinations of the cube root of 2, 1, and the cube root of 2 squared. Since it's a field, it has to have the cube root of 2 squared in it. And you can't get the cube root of 2 squared as a linear combination of the previous two. Um, and, okay, there's more to it than that. So you get all linear combinations of 1, 2 to the 1 third, and 2 to the 2 thirds. I'm, I'm using these fields as specific examples, particular examples. 
what, what all of these examples show you is that um, 